Lord has placed upon my heart a message, and I need your prayer, always, especially now. So pray for me as uh, we open the word, so that the Spirit can condescend in this place, and have our hearts be in all with joy in receiving the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we come before your presence to hear from you and you alone. Tune out everything in this room, in this world, so that we can connect solely and only to heaven. Lord, hide me behind the cross, lay my glory in the dust. Do for me a work that I'm incapable of doing for myself. Speak to me, through me, to all of us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. The title of the message that I was impressed to share is Sin and Death Separates. Sin and Death separates. I was searching this week as to what to present. It's always pastor can tell you and all of us who speak sometimes hard to find a message and you don't want to speak messages that you already spoke before. So it's so hard sometimes to come up with a message with the Lord impress upon me with a theme that came before my eyes and I was wow. And this is what came to my mind. Sin and death separate. Death was always a silent, mysterious intruder. It was never created by God. It was sin that introduced this resounding contrast to life called death. I recall I was only 12 years old when I was spending the holidays with my grandparents, my mother's parents, when I had the opportunity to make friends with some children living in the same area of my grandparents. I look forward to this time every year. I remember a boy by the name of Nicholas who lived on the same street who had a bicycle, which was not the privilege for most children at that time due to affordability. I remember I never had ridden a bike before. And this was the perfect opportunity. The challenge was Nicholas was not so willing to share his bike with anyone. There were a couple other boys like myself who was not as privileged as Nicholas. After much convincing, Nicholas eventually allowed us to ride his bike. We fell a couple of times off the bike, but I, along with the other boys, started learning how to ride after a while. We look forward to doing this every day. It was one evening. I noticed some of my friends standing in front of Nicholas's house. I went to inquire as to what was happening, only to learn that Nicholas and his sister was riding along the main road when Nicholas was hit by a drunk driver. Chill immediately went up my spine. But what I heard next was what gave me an experience that I've never had before. Nicholas died on a back. My mouth instantaneously went dry. I felt a strange feeling in my stomach and my heart started pounding as though it was about to jump out of my chest. This was my first real encounter or experience of losing someone I knew to the silent intruder called death. For the first time, I felt like Nicholas was a part of me. And in that very moment of hearing that heart-wrenching news, I felt a sense of separation. By this time, I could hear his mother screaming from the house. All around me was tears streaming down from my friends' faces. 
I could not hold back my tears myself. I felt as though a part of me has died. I could not imagine what his mother and own family was going through if I were only a friend and was experiencing what I was feeling. Have you ever experienced the loss of a loved one, a family member, a friend, a co-worker, or someone you recently met? Did you experience that feeling of separation that death causes? Many find it difficult to recover from that experience. As was the case with Nicholas's mother. In some instances, many never recovered from their loss, while it takes others years to recover. Yeah. What about death that gives the impression or sense or feeling as though we were somehow joined together before? Hence the feeling of separation whenever death occurs. More than anything else, death also seems to have the ability to awaken our dull sleeping senses to value the importance of life. It is for this reason there is so much weeping and wailing at funerals, especially by the gravesides. There is a feeling of separation. We have truly lost a loved one. A part of us, in a sense, has truly died. It is death, or is death the end? Can we live to accept the loss or separation of a loved one? Sin is the transgression of God's law. And the Bible says in John, 1 John 3, 4, Whosoever committed sin, transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. But the Bible continued to say in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How was sin introduced? Isaiah 14.12-14 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which this weakens the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That is exactly how sin was introduced. It didn't start here on this little earth, but it started right in a perfect place where it was perfect harmony called heaven by a perfect being called Lucifer. The Bible says his heart was lifted up. In Ezekiel chapter 28, Verse 14 to 17, it expounds on what happened to this covering cherub called Lucifer. Thou art the anointed cherub that covered, verse 14 says, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou was walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 15, thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Sin. Verse 16 says, By the multitude of thy merchandise, that they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, for the midst of the stone, from the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 17 says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee down to the ground, I will lay thee before kings, and they may behold thee. This perfect being, perfect angel, created by God's perfect hands, a 
allowed his heart to be lifted up. And in that experience, it led, led him to recognize himself above his creator. The Bible says that's how he fell. And that's exactly how sin was introduced. Romans 5 verse 12 to 14 describes now what Lucifer did to another set of God's creation in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 12 to 14 wherefore as by one man sin, who is that one man? Adam. See Adam again like Lucifer like Lucifer was created perfect by the perfect hands of God. And as his wife was deceived because her own heart was lifted up. Looking at how eating this fruit as Satan introduced to her by eating this fruit you become as God, like God, eluding your understanding. Have more wisdom. It led her to move away from the simplicity of the word of Christ when he said, all the trees that are, that are in the garden you can eat of except the tree that was in the midst. Thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. There was no death in the garden prior to this incident. Adam and Eve did not know or understand what death was until their eyes were shifted from God to themselves. And beloved, if ever a time we are living where God's creation has shifted our eyes from the Creator to ourselves, it is now. When I was much younger, beloved, I had never heard of a thing called selfie. But today, selfies are over. And everywhere you go, people are putting up selfies. But this is how sin entered. When one be lifted up self. So the Bible declares that wherefore as by one man, speaking about Adam, sin, sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The Bible continued to say, for unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that are not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So a lot of us sin like Adam. Why? Because Adam was created without sin. He never had the inclinations that we have. And so his choice to, to choose death, the consequence fell upon all of us without our choice. But as we came in this condition, the Bible says in Psalms 51, 5, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So inherently, my nature is to sin. So this condition was upon all. God in his mercy saw this. In his love saw what Adam and Eve's choice would have done to their entire race. 
So while Adam, exhausted, is one choice from choosing between life or death, he had no more opportunity to choose again. Why? Because his portion he already chose, which was death. He had life, but he chose death. And so, really and truly, he should not have an ability to choose again. But the fact that Adam continued to live, beloved, not just continue to live, but we see in the Bible that God was pursuing Adam in his sin while Adam was running away from God. And God said, Adam, because of what you have done, this is what I now need to do. And it's not because and at that moment that God was doing something, but God was in covenant with his son prior to Adam's sin. So when there was sin, immediately there was a savior. Amen. See, what Adam deserved because of his choice was separation. was feeling that sense of separation when he said he knew that the harmony that he once had with the father with Jesus when he came in the cool of the day to converse with him in the garden he felt that separation and all that came upon him was fear of the consequence that that separation brought as a result of sin. He knew it came back to his mind as a flood that the day that you eat of this fruit, therein you shall surely die. And he felt that experience of death already separating him. But the truth be told that he should have been immediately separated from God. But the fact that he lived to go through that experience told me God did something before. Are we together? Though? So the Bible is, continues to describe this issue. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says the sting of death is sin. But the strength of sin is the law. In other words, without the law, there is no determinant factor of what sin is. Think about it, beloved. If right on this very street here, Farragut, Avenue, or Road, there is no traffic law that applies, there will have people just running up on them with their car. Ooh, ooh, no stoplight, no law. And if they did anything wrong, you can't hold them responsible because there's no law. So when there is no law, there is no violation, no sin. So the idea that the law has been done away with, it actually makes no sense. Because those who say that knows that you still should not steal, you still should not lie. You still should not covet, fornicate, murder, and all these things that is written in the Ten Commandment laws. You see, what they are speaking to is the ministration of death that the law brings because of its violation. See, when the law is violated, it needs to execute the demand of the law upon the violator. And so the law in stone in the days of old was administration of death. But when Jesus came, he took that debt. He took that debt. Even 
even at the time Adam sinned. This is why the Bible can say that he's a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So sin is the result of this silent intruder called death. Therefore, sin is the root of the outcome of that separation that we experience as a result of death. James 1, 13 to 15 said, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away from his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So while there is sin still in this world, there is a sense of death in the air. Because sin is still in existence. Are you with me, beloved? So while we see people dying all around us each and every day, this death we see is not the wages of sin. It may be a consequence of sin, like sickness and pain and suffering is a consequence of sin, but it is not the wages of sin. You're like, hell, no, but I'm dead, dead. what is the wages of sin? Are they dying? Now listen to the pen of inspiration in the Spirit of Prophecy, the fourth edition, page 364, paragraph 2. This is what the pen of inspiration says concerning this wages of sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, she says, quoting Romans 6.23. While life is the inheritance of the righteous, death is a portion of the wicked, she says. The penalty threatened here in Romans 6.23 is not merely temporal death. So she says that the penalty threatened in Romans 6.23 is not merely temporal death. She says that for all must suffer this. Which death is she calling temporal death? Say that again. Which death is she calling temporal death? Because the only death we see today is what we see people die. And we know no other death. Isn't that true? So we see that as the wages of sin. The Bible said the wages of sin is death. Isn't that so? So we describe that as the wages of sin. But here the pen of inspiration is saying, no, 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 no. The penalty that is threatened in Romans 6.23 is not the temporal debt that we all must suffer in this life. She says, it is the second debt. The opposite of everlasting life. So in other words, the wages of sin, which is death, and then the opposite, the contrast that speak to, and the gift of God is eternal life, is showing you that eternal life is contrast with the wages of sin, so that death there that is the result of sin can only be eternal death. Amen. So why she said what we are seeing around us every day with our family members, our loved ones, our co-workers and strangers and all who are dying today is a temporal death. A matter of fact, the Bible describes it as sin death. Sin death. She continued to say, in the consequence of Adam's sin, death passed upon all mankind. All alike go down into the grave, but through the provisions of the plan of salvation, all are to be brought forth from their graves. Then those who have not secured the pardon of their sin must receive the penalty of their transgression. The death that we see each day that took my friend Nicholas, that which, that which I describe as a silent intruder, though our loved ones after being taken by this death, though it causes us to experience a sense of separation like a part of us being removed, this death is not the wages of sin. 
Though we are left in grief and sadness of heart, it's only a consequence of sin as indicated by the pen of inspiration and not the wages of sin. This death, though impactful, it is only but a sleep. It is temporary. Now Daniel 2 begins to, to, to describe, Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 describes now this issue of death as it relates to how it will occur and what will happen after death. Now Daniel chapter 12 2 says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting content. So this is why the time that we are now seeing today is temporary. For all shall be resurrected. Some to eternal life and some to everlasting shame and contempt. So though we may lose loved ones now, beloved, they're only sleeping. They're only resting in the grave. And if they have secure Jesus' pardon for their sin, if they have embraced Christ and received him in their life, then they will be resting in Jesus. Amen. They will be asleep in Jesus. Looking for the resurrection. Amen. So Daniel here describes how and why what we are now seeing it's temporary. But we want to investigate a little more. John 11, 11 to, to, to 12, Jesus here is also describing this issue of a temporal death, which is really not the wages of sin. Here in, in John 11, Jesus was here addressing Lazarus and his death to, his, to the disciples. Remember, Lazarus, Jesus was given a message that Lazarus was sick to the point of, of death. And a call was given to Jesus to come to Lazarus while he was sick so he would have saved him. But Jesus delayed. Not just delayed, but he delayed for four days. Because he wanted to make a statement. And so here as they were discussing this issue, Jesus was now talking to disciples in the 11th chapter of the book of John. Verse 11 said, These things said he, Jesus, and after that he said unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said the disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Verse 13 said, Jesus said, How be it, how be it, Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. Then verse 14, Jesus said, then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. You see, they couldn't see what Jesus was saying when he said that Lazarus was asleep and he going forth to awake him out of his sleep. They didn't understand that. Because all they knew when somebody's eyes is closed and their breath leaves their body, they are dead. They are dead. In their mind, if Jesus aligns or makes synonymous sleep with death, right? It, 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 for them it's confusing. So when Jesus mentioned sleep, the only sleep they knew was the sleep here on earth. But Jesus was showing them something deeper. The Bible says in John 5, 28, 29, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. What really is then the wages of sin? If it's not the sleep death that we often see around us day and night, every single day somebody dies. And it comes home when it's our loved one. We are reminded that death is our portion that is appointed unto man and wants to die and then the judgment. But it only comes home to us this very thought when it visits our doorsteps. 
to what really is the wages of sin and what gives Christ the authority to call man from this sleep dead. What is the wages of sin? Let us look at it again. And the Bible only speaks to Romans 6.23, an explicit description of what the wages of sin is. And it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we make that correlation that this death here is not talking about a temporal death. It is talking about eternal separation from your creator. So the wages of sin is eternal death or eternal separation from God. What we describe today as death is only but asleep until the life giver cause the dead, those who are asleep from the grave. This death or wages of sin also involves, as mentioned in Revelation 14, verse 9 and 10, torment. So here we identify that Romans 6.23 that speaks about the wages of sin being death. The death that is being described here is eternal. But not only eternal, it comes with torment. So we know that there are some people who have died this temporal death or torture. We see this in the history that some were martyred, burned, tied to the stake and burned. Some was thrown into the lion's den and was torn to pieces. And that's a horrific death. Oh, beloved, it is not the wages of sin. You see, the Christians who were thrown into the amphitheaters and given before the Caesars as a spectacle and a show, those Christians die with joy. Those who were tied to the stake and burned alive, though it was a torturous and wicked death, they rejoiced in their dying. Many died in peace. So it's not the how you die. It's not the how you die. It is what the death that you're dying is about. Is it eternal? Or is it temporal? So here we have discovered that the wages of sin is an eternal separation from God. And then Revelation 14 describes a little more by the third angel about that death. Hear what the word of God says. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. This is talking about the wages of sin. The kind of death that is experienced here is different from what people are dying today. Even if they were tortured, even if it was painful, even if they were suffering, there is an experience that they go through that is not the same as this experience. And by the way, no man except one has been through this experience yet. No man. The Bible says there will be the wrath of God being poured out without mercy. That's what mixture means. In the cup of his indignation, and they shall experience a torment. Beloved, what I experienced when I learned that my friend Jonathan was, was killed by this drunk driver, I, I barely can describe as I talk about it, the emotions come up and I feel that separation again. But it's nothing compared to what those who will be lost will experience, beloved. Nothing compared to that. At that time, they will experience being slowly separated from the Creator's hand. They will experience now that true separation. The one that we are currently experiencing today, even in these temporal temporal. temporal uh, death situation where we lose a loved one. We feel as though a part of us is gone, is, is being removed, and it, it, we feel as though, man, we can't live without this part. 
Beloved, I can't even describe it. I am trying to give us a description of the truth about the wages of sin. It's not deceived that it's not somebody going to bed and not waking up tomorrow morning. No, that's a consequence. As a matter of fact, that is God's mercy. He allows us to sleep, beloved. Some of us are sick and suffering because of sin. And he don't want us to suffer no more. He allows us to sleep. That's mercy, beloved. Even though we were suffering, even though we were in pain or our family member was in pain, he allowed them to sleep. Because he don't want them to prolong in such suffering. He said he will not give us more than we can bear. So when we lose our loved one in that situation, rejoice, the Bible says. But think about it. We never ever rejoice when somebody dies. Especially a loved one. We mourn and we cry. And we are in pain while we are feeling a sense of separation. Beloved, that is just an introduction to what will happen in the end. We have no idea of what it is. So while Solomon declares in Ecclesiastes chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5 and 6, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead not, know not, not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished, neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. What that means is, when our loved ones die, they are in an unconscious sleep. You know when you sleep and you dead in sleep, you don't know what's going on around you? That is what is happening. They are resting in the grave. There is no idea that a disembodied section of their body goes to heaven or hell. No, the Bible doesn't teach that. It doesn't teach that. They are resting. This is why you know, when Jesus comes back, he can call them from the grave. Are you listening to me? He can call them because they're asleep. So the Solomon knew the state of the dead. Paul declares there should be no ignorance on this topic concerning the dead. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, he said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are at asleep. Again, temporal dead. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So beloved, as we sorrow, we shouldn't sorrow as people in the world who don't have hope in the resurrection of Jesus. We shall always look back that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And because he lives, those who die here will live again. So he said we shouldn't mourn as those who have no hope. When those who are temporarily asleep. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also we sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. You didn't catch that. Those who sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. Amen. You see, we've been studying a lesson for a couple of weeks now that talks about Ephesians chapter 2 with, 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 with Paul mentioning humanity being placed in Christ. Now, when we read that passage of scripture in the book of Ephesians, we discovered that this occurred when humanity was dead in sins and trespasses. And the Bible makes clear that while that occurred, Christ the Father not only placed humanity in Christ when he came to represent us, but also when he died, humanity was in Christ. When he was resurrected, humanity was resurrected with him and ascended together with him and sits together with him in heavenly places. While humanity have not chosen this at all, while humanity may not know that they are in Christ and they are living their lives unto themselves apart from Christ, not having Christ in them, the Father said, He made it so and placed humanity in Christ. You see, this is why when humanity who accepts Christ and Christ come into them, they experience a oneness. So when they die, 
they don't die apart from Christ. They are still in Christ, and the fact that they secure their pardon and remain in Christ, when Christ returns, he can call them back because they're in himself. So that is the authority that he had because he took their penalty. He paid their payment. So he had the authority to call them back to life. Even those who did not accept him. Because he placed the whole human race in himself. So even those who did not appreciate him and his sacrifice for them, he is able to call even them to life. The only problem is he cannot give them eternal life. You see, eternal life is not just a time and place in the future. Because when we talk about eternal life, we talk about heaven and, you know, we mortal soul and we can't die and we are living forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. But the Bible says, and this is life eternal that we know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. See, uh, eternal life is not just a time and place in the future, but eternal life is an experience in Jesus. Knowing yeah. having an experience or knowledge of who Jesus is and what he has done for you. Yeah. That is eternal life, beloved, because if you experience Jesus and what he has done, you will experience his love, you will experience his grace, you will experience his mercy, you will experience his forgiveness. And that is eternal. Why, beloved? Because it brings a peace that is everlasting. No matter what you go through, you will always experience that peace because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Amen. The issue here is that there was war on the human race to separate the human race from God. And Satan tricked Eve and Adam saw what happened to her and made a decision to go against God. But God, but God, but God, who is rich in mercy, who didn't allow Adam's selfish thought of a woman to get above his love for Adam. But God chose before Adam chose to sin to step in Adam's place. Yeah. So when the Bible says here he's rich in mercy, abundant in grace, it is talking about doing something for the undeserving. Adam didn't deserve that. He deserved that. And he turned our separation and torment. But Jesus took that when he stepped in and allowed Adam to live. And by the way, when Adam lived, every human being that exists from time past to now and forever has experienced that benefit that Adam received. We were born into a gift, beloved. We were born into grace. We were born into God's mercy and forgiveness. The life that we come to have that he chose to give. Amen. So even those who have not come to know this beloved, even those who claim to be atheists and who have no respect for God are benefactors of this life. This is why Paul says to the Athenians who was in Hill worshiping an unknown God, he said, in him you will live and move and have your being. In other words, on the, the, the bread you eat is not the cross of God. On the here you read, it's at the cross of Calvary. Whether you believe it or not, you are benefactors of Jesus stepping in when Adam sinned. So we looked at what gave Jesus the authority to now be able to resurrect those who have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Adam, Satan said, yeah, this is why when, 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 when Michael went down for the body of Jesus Christ and he went over to take the body, loose of Satan appeared. I said, where are you going? He's in the prison of death. He committed sin. Therefore, he's mine. And my, Michael says, the Father rebukes you. You see, 
the father of a plan to send me in the future to deliver him. And so now this is a, 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 a rain check to take him because of my blood that I will shed. And this is why Paul says, get rain from Adam to Moses. That didn't rain no more because Jesus took Moses from the grave because he made a down payment on Moses. Are you listening to me? So in the fulfillment of time, Jesus come and paid it all, not just for Moses, but for all humanity who came to the loins of Adam. Amen. He took our penalty, our curse, our condemnation, removed it, redeemed us from the curse of the Lord, forgave humanity, not only in their trespasses against them, because all our trespasses was appealed, was held against himself. So he's saying, I have reconciled you, won you over into a relationship with God again in myself. I place all of you in me. You are in me. This is why the Bible says we have not an high priest who is not touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Jesus understands up to know everything that we go through. Don't ever think that you are going through something that God does not understand. Jesus was placed in humanity. Humanity was placed in him. This is why he understands what we are going through. No matter what you experience right now, beloved. No matter what your trouble is, your trial, your tribulation, the Bible says, we have not an high priest who is not touched by our feeling of our infirmities. Why? Because he came as flesh and experienced everything in flesh condemning sin in the flesh, not for itself, but for all of us. So he understands. So here Paul says in 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10, he says, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. This happened before me even come into existence, beloved. But it's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. He removed that death that was placed upon the human race, beloved. He took it upon himself, so it was abolished. Don't worry, don't run the horn or hang it over mankind. He abolished that death. No, there's silence and quiet in the congregation. Because you're saying, no, but if he's as abolished that, then how will some die in the end? How will some face the second death? You see, beloved, sleep death is being described by our theologians today in our church as the first death. But we read through the Bible and through the pen of inspiration that no, 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 sleep death is only a temporal death. A matter of fact, the Bible describes it theologically as a sleep. Why? The Bible described that we know that when people die and go, we don't see them no more than in the grave. So why is it described as a sleep? We recognize that Jesus steps in and has taken the penalty of sin, which is eternal separation from God. That penalty involved torment. Jesus was on the cross being tormented. Jesus on the cross suffering that separation. And the Bible says that the penalty of inspiration also a claim to this fact that he died from a that was my little young experience I was having losing my friend. My heart was broken. Just to see a little boy who was a friend of mine being separated by sleep, temporal death. It broke my heart. Can you imagine the separation between the father and the son who was one together from eternity past? No experiencing that separation, beloved. He tore Jesus' heart apart. And why he experienced the separation? Because he bore our guilt. He bore all our shame. And our sins weighed heavily on him. And it caused a separation from the Father. So he's the only one, beloved. And so this is what gives him now the authority. The Bible makes clear in Hebrews chapter 9 that we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. 
Fast like gives him all the authority because he not only took that, but he rose again for our justification. Amen. Or because we were justified by him dying in our place. So because he took us in himself, died with us in himself, rose with us in himself, the Bible says he has the authority over death and the grave. We see that clear in Revelation 1.18. I am he that liveth, and was dead, and the old I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Amen. So the death here that he abolished is that death that came upon the human race through Adam. But we know that there was another death called the second death. As a matter of fact, another condemnation. You see, we started with a story showing that sin didn't start here on earth. It started right in a perfect place, which is heaven. At the end of that situation, Satan, or Lucifer, who now became Satan, and those angels who have aligned themselves with him, rebelled against God. And by their rebellion, they were condemned. And so, their condemnation was reserved. It's not yet going on as many teach that when you die, you're going to burn in hell and burn from eternity and all the way to another eternity. God is not like that. God, you think God would have people burning as long as he lived? What kind of God would be? That would be. That's why they have God today as a sadistic God. Judgmental, exacting. Because there's a misrepresentation of the truth about who God really is. But the Bible teaches that Satan, when he was condemned, was reserved for future. So the death that Jesus died truly is the first death, not this sleep death that we now experience. It was Jesus alone who faced the wages of sin, as indicated in Revelation 19, uh, 15. He treaded the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty by himself for all humanity. The second death being mentioned in scripture is a reference to the condemnation specifically placed upon the devil and his angels reserved for future mention in Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, he cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Therefore, those who refuse to secure Jesus' forgiveness and pardon, those who treat with disrespect the spirit of, God, of grace, those who tread on the foot the blood of the covenant, calling it an unholy thing, will face Satan's condemnation. In other words, they will have committed a sin that the law now can demand a new payment. And by virtue of that rejection and rebellion as did Satan, because that's what he's doing, beloved. He's working hard for us to commit the same sin he committed in, yes. which is the height of selfishness. To show that we don't need God, we are our own gods. That's what the world is teaching today with the whole idea of transgender when God said he made male and female. And they are saying, no, there is no gender. Even in heaven, there is no gender. God is no gender. is day and way and all kind of madness. Because they have rejected God. But what Jesus said to Paul, I leave them to their reprobate mind. To believe a lie. Send them a strong delusion. Because that's what they want to be. Because they are overcome with Satan's personality. You have to take on his character, his image. And so they are aligning themselves to be condemned under his condemnation. So in other words, you are taking a second condemnation. Which was reserved for the devil and his angels. So that condemnation that came upon Adam and his race, Jesus took. Redeeming man from the curse of the law. Reconciling man unto himself, not holding their trespasses against them, but the Father held it against Jesus. So the Bible now therefore declares, John 3, 16 to, to 18, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in that love would not be perished, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth in him. The Bible says, He that believeth 
on him is not condemned, but he that delivered not is condemned already, meaning condemned now the moment they reject the sacrifice of Jesus, the moment they reject the blood of the covenant, the Bible says in that moment when the Spirit of God leaves them, because they are not willing to hear no more about the redemption, about the reconciliation, about the forgiveness, about all that God has done. At that moment, they are condemned. In other words, they have aligned themselves under Satan's condemnation. Are you listening to me? And he continues to say, He believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come in the world, and man love darkness rather than light. As I close, beloved, there is fear of death because of its future torment. The fear really is is in that separation that the ultimate second death will cause, which is eternal oblivion. What we experience now in losing our loved one is just a light forties of what those who are lost will experience. What I am, what I and, my, and many of you have experienced with losing someone will be the very experience magnified when the lost are separated from God eternally. The while that sounds discouraging because we know that sin is the problem. And we know that many of us today are probably still living in practicing our sin. We are struggling. And we are fearful that if we don't overcome these sin, they will overcome us to the peril of our souls. John reassures us. My little children, I write unto you that you sin not. But if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father through Jesus the righteous. John continued to say in 1 John 4, 18, 16, and 17, There is no fear in love, but love, but perfect love cast out all fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love, and we have known and believed the love of God, like the love that God has for us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in God dwelleth in love, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Beloved, Jesus. Love manifested at the cross for his enemies is the love he's seeking to put in all our hearts. When we experience that love, then we will manifest he, Christ, in us in this world. And that love will give us peace. That love will give us boldness. That love will make us know that we overcome sin that we are struggling here today with by the blood of the Lamb, by the love of the Lamb. We overcome sin and it makes us love not our lives unto the death. There is no fear in that kind of love because it's a self-sacrificing love. So beloved, we all have been touched by death. Temporal death, but none of us have been touched with the wages of sin. There is hope, even for those who we have lost, had they received Jesus in their hearts, they would have received life eternal in Him. And so, if that's the case, then we can mourn with hope in the resurrection that there will be a time that we will be able to see our life. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Amen. So please, we don't need to mourn as those without hope. But we can mourn in the hope of the resurrection. Amen. Let us not, beloved, allow sin to master our lives that we may end up aligning ourselves with Satan. Let us be whole.
behold the love of Christ so that we can be one in Christ that even in death we will never be separated from the 